Once again, we welcome you to Moving Forward with Young Voices, and I'm happy to welcome Nicholas Anthony. He's a policy analyst at the Cato's Institute, Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives, as well as a contributor for Young Voices. And uh, Nicholas, great to have, or do you prefer Nick? Should we call you Nick? <laughs> <laughs> Nick, please. Yeah, thank you. Nick, I'm glad to have you on board. Um, tell us just a little bit more about yourself for those who are meeting you for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a policy analyst at the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives, which basically boils down to figuring out what is the status quo with money? How does it get into our pockets? And really, is there another way to go about this? Is the government issuing the dollar the only form of currency that we can have? Or are there other options? And that gets us into things like cryptocurrencies, private coinage, and everything in between. And I dare say for anyone who's uh, in an econ program right now, monetary and financial policy is probably one of the most exciting areas that you can get into right now. We're really in an unprecedented time. Well, and, and speaking of private coinage, um, that's that's the topic we're going to touch on today. I'm looking at a piece you wrote for Reason.com. Americans want change. By that, you mean pocket change. Private mints are the solution. Talk to me about the, the coin shortage. I'm beginning to see signs pop up again saying, hey, we're, if you, we can't if you don't have exact change, would you mind rounding up? And, you know, we're, we're having a shortage of change. What are the reasons behind this? Well, it really boils down to when the pandemic first hit and we had this huge lockdown. Everyone was locked away in their houses, businesses were shuttered. And normally you have coins just cycling through the system. But when you have all these different areas shut down, there's nowhere for them to go. They get stuck in our pockets. They get stuck in that old jar by the washing machine. And Because there was also a number of health concerns surrounding what may or may not happen with handing off cash or or coins, people started also moving to digital payments. So slowly but surely, we had all the coins kind of disappear into the couch cushions. And they're still out there. It's just they're not getting where they need to be. And so it poses a really unique situation where the government can't exactly just come in and take a break from the money printer, go over to the, the coin mint and say, let's flood all the quarters we can into the system. That's really only a short term solution here. So I have to ask in a digital age, how important are, you know, coins? How important is it to have change? Because it does seem like in some ways we're moving beyond that. I mean, this isn't the old days where you'd carry a little sack of gold with you and toss one on the counter, you know, here, outfit my horse, whatever. Um, do, do we need coins today? What, what's the reasoning behind, you know, continuing to mint coins? That was one of the things that I did have to take a while to, to think about how I would um, communicate that this is a big problem because a lot of people that I talk to about it, that's the first thing that they say is, well, let's just let them go. And it really boils down, I think, of all the issues at hand, it really boils down to the most important is there's millions of people in the United States that don't have a bank account or they don't have access to a full suite of banking services, which means they're not using debit and credit cards. They're not using uh, PayPal to to get around or Venmo that requires a, a bank account be linked to it. And For them, it's extremely important to be able to use cash, and part of the cash experience is being able to have change made. Uh, One of the key ways that people were trying to get around this whole issue was just rounding the, the prices up or down. And you get into a little bit of a hairy problem there for folks that 10 cents for most people is not gonna be a big deal, but for somebody who's living dollar by dollar, 10 cents rounded up here and there a couple times in a week is really going to add up. And so for everyone who's on that line, it is incredibly important, as well as we still have a pretty large industry base that's based on coins. I I think most people have seen a a coin laundry somewhere in their town. And there's even a whole other subset of industries that surprisingly still rely on coins for the day-to-day exchange. 
Talk to me about private minting of coins, because this I'm very interested in this, if for no other reason that uh, sometimes I think competition is a good thing. And I know legal tender laws and all, you know, uh, the government approved coins. These are legal tender for all debts, public and private. But what's the advantage of private minting of coins? Well, this is something that I always try to point folks to if you're ever interested in learning more about private minting. George Selgin has an amazing book called Good Money. And he talks about this history of folks stepping in, because this is not the first coin shortage. There have been many throughout time. And he talks about through the 1600s, 1700s, that private mints would come up and start introducing coins of their own design to make up for what was missing. So you'd have, at the time, governments were pulling coins to remove the silver content from it to try to debase the currency. And in that time, you'd also end up with shortages from also wars ongoing. And he talks about the fact that we had countless examples of mints across Europe stepping in to offer those services. And we even had it outside of the Great Depression. We had people supplying private, what was called scripts at the time. And they were offering these private forms of money, these local monies, to try to make up for the shortage. They weren't trying to counterfeit the, the existing money. They weren't trying to say, oh, here's what we're gonna uh, completely abandon it with. They were just trying to solve an immediate problem at hand. Talk to me about when this has been done before. I. I, you know, I like to think, oh, I'm still remembering all the things that are relevant, but I had forgotten back in 2006, there was the uh, Norfed Liberty Dollar, and I had forgotten. I think, didn't they face criminal prosecution from the federal government for creating an alternative? And what was the story there? It, it is a fascinating story, and anyone who's interested, I highly suggest digging into this one because it's a, it's a neat and also a little scary rabbit hole to fall down. Uh, so the North Fed Liberty Dollar came up kind of as a, as a warehouse receipt where you would have, or rather the organizers had all this silver on hand and they were true proponents of, of sound money as it's traditionally understood, uh, being back to when we were on the, the gold standard and they were trying to figure out a way to kind of bring that thought process back into the, the modern era. And the federal government quickly started to have a problem with this. And it, it wasn't because it was a carbon copy of, of U.S. coins, but rather that it was competing with U.S. coins. And the U.S. Mint and Department of Justice issued a press release saying exactly that. And part of the U.S. code that they looked at and said that this is how we're going to officially say this is a problem is the law bars coins of original design. It can be just about anything and as long as it's totally original, it's still off limits if it's a metal coin. Wow. So is there any prospect of that to restrictive language being lifted? I mean, uh, is the Fed immovable on this or is there some flexibility now? That's going to be the hard part to, to see what they're willing to do here. I've been trying to make the case that this is something that very, very simply could be fixed. It's, it's three words to take out of the code of original design. And if we just take out that section, I think that alone could do wonders. And one of the things I can see as being a kind of a hedge maybe in their favor is not only take out of original design, but also add in what they actually mean by counterfeiting. So say something like, we, the, the U.S. government, the federal government, reserve the right to use words like, like liberty or the United States of America or so on and so forth. I can see that being much more in the spirit of the design of the language to prohibit counterfeiting from taking place. And that's where I'm trying to figure out, will they or won't they take this on? Because obviously they have an incentive to keep all money off the table. But I think as far as their incentives go for preserving the, the spirit of the United States, I think that's something that very clearly needs to be removed from the law. Nick, we've got just under a minute here. Um, with the move towards central bank digital currencies, and I've heard this talked about from a number of different uh, countries and areas, um, 
does it make this a, a moot point? Are we going to be cash free, coin free at some point? I don't think we're going to be, or rather I'll say, I think we will uh, end up seeing central bank digital currencies impact this area, but I don't think we're going to see cash or coins go away anytime soon because there's so many people, the folks that I'm talking about before that are living as unbanked or underbanked that rely so heavily on cash. In my eyes, especially with, for instance, the privacy concerns that are at play with a central bank digital currency, I just don't see those folks running into the government's arms. All right. We are talking with Nick Anthony. He is a Young Voices contributor. Nick, where can people find you on social media? You can find me on Twitter at Econ with Nick or on Cato.org. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. We are pleased to welcome Adam Shepardson. He's a Young Voices contributor. And Adam and I have a very interesting topic to cover here. But Adam, first I'm going to ask you to tell our listeners just a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. So I'm Adam. Um, I'm currently an undergraduate student, and I study economics and history, so very much related to policy. All right. So uh, listen, this is this is not one of the states I would have expected to lead out when it came to reform on marijuana laws, but... Oklahoma, it turns out, is becoming quite the the place for freedom in terms of uh, cannabis, both medicinally. I don't know if they're. Um, can you tell me? Are, are they uh, have they really legalized recreational, or is it purely just medicinal? So, um, so, so Oklahoma is interesting in the sense that they have only legalized medical marijuana. Okay, but the requirements in order to receive a license to buy medical marijuana are so permissive that it's basically recreational. <laughs> and and I understand that to to start a dispensary. They, they've actually lowered the cost. I mean, um, I, I lived in Utah up until about a year ago and watched that state go through its uh, process of, of grudgingly legalizing medical marijuana. And, and my goodness, the apparatus, you know, and the, the licensure and just the process will only open a very limited number of dispensaries. Oklahoma has taken a far different approach. Tell me about what they've done that differs from other states. Sure. So Oklahoma has an extremely free market ethos. Um, they took their same approach to the economy and applied that to the marijuana industry. So whereas you see in other red states um, where uh, many of the legislators and the, and the people who, who vote in, in red states tend to be a little bit wary of the social effects of marijuana. And therefore, they kind of put aside um, some of their more um, pro-capitalist or market-oriented um, outlook when they approach this issue. Oklahoma did not do that whatsoever. So Oklahoma's 2018 ballot measure that legalized medical marijuana in the state was very much att- was very much an attempt to be as laissez-faire as they possibly could. So basically, if you want to start a marijuana business in Oklahoma, you need to pay a $2,500 app fee. You need to be a resident, and all of your sales are subject to a 7% excise tax. And that's basically it. <laughs> so there are no local bans and story locations. The only exception is that there are some particulars about being close to a school zone, but that's r- pretty much about it. You know, now I want to contrast that with what I saw in Utah as it was legalizing medical marijuana. I think, if I remember right, the starting um, rate for a license was about $100,000. And I know this is going to mm. shock you, Adam, but, um, you know, a number of legislators who previously had been very strong against you know any relaxing of marijuana laws, when they realized, oh, we can make money on this, suddenly they were the ones applying for licenses, and they had the means, the backers, to come <laughs> up with enough money. So I, I appreciate the laissez-faire approach. I think that's much more mm-hmm. consistent with freedom and with, with actual justice. How has this panned out for Oklahoma? I mean, are they having buyer's remorse? Well, so I don't think that anyone can argue with the positive impacts this has had on the Oklahoma economy. So in 2021 alone, there were $900 million in marijuana sales. And um, with that uh, excise, that very small excise tax, um, that does translate to good revenue for the state. And some of that revenue was put back into Oklahoma's education system. Um, so I think that regardless of your perspective, whether you are very, um, very much of the mindset that um, when businesses make money, it's good for all of us because they can put that money back into the economy or 
when the government takes a little bit off the top, they can fund things like the education system and, you know, those types of public service projects. Oklahoma has tried to serve both interests, and it's done so very effectively. Very interesting. Now, contrast that with California, which, uh, you know, was mm-hmm. one of the very first ones not only to go with medical, but even recreational marijuana. But talk to me about their regulatory framework. I understand it's among the most oppressive in the nation. Oh, yeah. Um, California has done such a bad job that they actually had to bail out their marijuana industry. So, again, to, to, re- to reemphasize that point, they had to bail out marijuana of all things. So in 2021, 20, um, the same year that Oklahoma made over $900 million in, in marijuana sales. California had to put $100 million of taxpayer money back into the marijuana industry to keep it afloat. And a big problem that um, that caused this was their um, heavy regulatory framework that they put onto marijuana growers and sellers. Um, a lot of it stemming from this really lengthy environmental review process that um, basically shoves marijuana uh, producers into this strange temporary license framework that about 82% of marijuana businesses are stuck in because they can't pass the environmental review. And on top of that, there are all these local bans where a lot, many localities in California don't even allow the dispensaries to begin with. Um, so you don't have this um, really open free market that you see in places like Oklahoma. So I noticed in your article, which is published in The Oklahoman, you talk about how conservatives and liberals alike can find value in considering Oklahoma as a solid but imperfect launching pad. What are some of the key lessons that they've learned and mistakes that other states might be able to learn from? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that the the main takeaway from Oklahoma is that um, getting the government out of the way and allowing a business to function in a way that works for both the producer and the consumer will produce good economic outcomes. So that helps both the the state, again, with the public interest funding projects that I've talked about, and also the consumer and the producer by allowing businesses to make money and consumers to buy the products that they want at low prices, especially relative to these other states that jack up prices with high taxes and high uh, regulatory burdens for the businesses themselves. Um, And additionally to that, there's also a um, impact here on the ability of people to live freely without government intrusion on um, what they do in their homes as private citizens. So um, even if you don't buy the economic argument, perhaps um, the the basic argument of individual liberty and allowing people to make choices with their bodies that they think are good for them or that make their lives better. Um, and perhaps that is something that is worth considering on its own, even separate from economics. No, I'm with you on that. And I, I I still I'm just I'm surprised just because I used to live in Oklahoma a long time ago. (laughs) It's a very conservative state, or at least that's that's how I remember it. And so Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that this was a very easy sell. And yet uh, here they are leading out. And uh, and apparently, you know, it's it's not resulting in, you know, destruction of biblical proportions like uh, we, we've heard in other states if we loosen laws even the tiniest bit yeah yeah um well so to be fair uh the measure was passed very narrowly in, in 2018 and now full recreational marijuana where you don't need to get a doctor's permission or that little check to get a license um that will be on the ballot in 2022 or it's expected to be um, there are two different ballot measures that are going forward and um it remains to be seen whether they'll get like legally challenged so they can't be voted on or anything that that kind of um political games and that, that do occur so that might pass and we'll see what happens there to see like where the public opinion stands in the state um on full legalization but um definitely the fact that you could even get over a majority of, of voters to um decide this was a good idea and that both the individual liberty argument and the economics argument um more convincing is definitely like they reflect so well on Oklahoma as a state and the people there and the the their willingness to apply um their general principles about capitalism and laissez-faire to something like marijuana that might not be the most comfortable for them. Isn't that kind of the test, though, of, of a person's you know <laughs> commitment to liberty? Are you willing to support another person's freedom to choose to do peaceful things that you still may not agree with? And, you know, it's surprising how mm-hmm. few people are, are able to answer that question in the affirmative. Now, what about the federal government? Tell me what your feel is as far as um, is there any movement on the federal level towards deregulation or even decriminalizing marijuana? Mm -hmm. So back in April, um, the Moore Act passed the House of Representatives, which would allow for the legalization of marijuana at the federal level. Um, 
there is some debate over whether this would be effective because it would add additional taxes on to the state programs that already exist for legalization, both sure. medical and, and recreational. Um, so there are there is reasonable debate over whether that heavy taxation or that additional taxation um, would depress the legal market or whether it, it would, you know, that, that's definitely a, an issue that's up in the, in the air, and I wouldn't favor adding on more tax to the federal level. However, it also would expunge um, existing marijuana convictions, which I think would be such a massive net positive for, for the, the nation as a whole, because you would um, allow these people who have been uh, kind of wrongfully convicted <laughs> for, for consuming a plant, really, at the end of the day, um, to reenter society and not feel the burden of having that record. So I think that would be good. Um, I would hope that the taxes get scaled back and that we wouldn't see an additional cost put on the industry, though. All right. We are talking with Adam Shepardson. He is a Young Voices contributor. Adam, where can people find you on uh, social media? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter at Real Adam Shep, and um, you could also find me on LinkedIn if you would like to. Oh, well. Okay. Thank you so much. Very interesting conversation. I hope we talk again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. We are pleased to welcome back to the show Jane Bambauer. She is also, she's in addition to being a Young Voices contributor, you're also a professor of law at University of Arizona. Jane, is there anything else I've left out of uh, who you are? Uh, no, that, that summarizes everything. <laughs> well, it's, it's great to connect with you once again. And I have to admit, I'm looking at your article in the Washington Post, and I'm having such mixed feelings. The, the headline is, letting police access Google location data can help solve crimes. And the, the part yeah, of me now, that's... I did not write the headline, okay. just for full disclosure. They changed my headline. So go ahead. So, I want <laughs> I crimes... Too. <laughs> yeah, I want to see crimes solved. I want to see justice done. But I'm leery when but big that's tech, too simple. yeah, when when they start handing over information. Um, talk to me a little bit about uh, about why this is an issue and and uh, where where should we look to find that uh, the balance between privacy and security? Yeah. Okay. Good. So, um, so that uh, the Washington Post op ed was about a specific case that involves a new style of police investigation, and so I want to just start by by um, finding some common ground with you, because I too actually am very concerned about rampant use and access to data that is collected by private companies, uh, but then used for criminal investigations or curiosity or whatever <laughs> whatever other purposes by the government. Uh, and and but, but this case, I'm going to argue, and I'm gonna try to change your mind, um, shows a path that I think is quite sensible because it doesn't give the police access to everything um, and it's, it's tied to a crime. So, so could I start by telling you a little bit about how the police did this investigation? Please do. Okay, so um, there was a robbery of a bank and the police knew that the robber, they didn't know much about the robber, but they knew that he was carrying a Google Android phone because he used it to cover his face from the security cameras, <laughs> all right? And uh, so they tried traditional police investigation uh, techniques and nothing worked. They, um, they thought they had a lead because someone called in a tip, but it turned out just to be like a disgruntled ex-girlfriend getting back at her ex-boyfriend. They thought uh, they also got another tip about someone who drove a similar car, but that was just a dead end. Um, and so once the case was starting to go cold, the detective reached out to Google and asked for de-identified data on um, every uh, cell phone, every, every device that was within 150 meters of the center of the bank during the hour that spanned the time when the crime, when the robbery took place. Um, and so there's some back and forth that isn't really terribly important. Ultimately, Google found 19 such devices. They showed what those devices were doing for the hour. They didn't say who they belonged to. The police then asked for um, another hour's worth of data on a subset of those 19. I think it was like six or something. And then from that additional hour's worth of data, they, they realized which phone very probably uh, belonged to the, to the robber. And so then at that point, Google re-identified uh, the, the name of the device owner. Okay, so this is 
quite creepy, I'll agree, in the sense that um, we know that this kind of geolocation data is tracked about all of us, or at least most of us. By default, it is often collected by our, by our um, service providers. Um, and the thought that the police can just go without, without a warrant or probable cause and get some data about us is quite troubling. Um, but, and the Supreme Court has actually said that in a recent case called Carpenter, um, they said that the police cannot go to a company like Google and say, hey, give me the last 150 days worth of location data um, on, on Brian, right? Um, uh, but this type of investigation is in a Fourth Amendment no man's land because the amount of data that's being requested is quite narrow, and it's also very closely tied to the known facts from a crime. So I'm arguing that that actually makes it substantially different from the style of investigation where the police have a hunch and they want to know about some person because instead they're trying to work backwards from a crime. And so they don't have as much discretion. They can't go on these, um, you know, sort of um, personally or politically um, motivated uh, witch hunts. Uh, and more importantly, I guess, you know, I, I am concerned right now. We have a real crime clearance problem in the United States. We don't have good methods for the police to get their investigation started. And that's what you need to do in order to meet the probable cause standard. And so I see a lot of promise in this style of, you know, high tech investigation. I have to give the police credit. I think it was ingenious the way that they narrowed down the data and were able to to bring it down to what three people that were likely and, and found the right person as a result. Right. That's yes. that's brilliant. And there, this wasn't a small amount of money. It was almost two hundred thousand dollars that this person walked out of the bank with. Right. But. I, I, you know, the, the civil libertarian in me is always going to be a little bit leery about um, catching the guilty by straining the straining a whole net full of innocent people, you know, in trying to find them. Um, I know it's not a perfect well, world, but. Well, I want to compare the digital net that we're worried about with the old fashioned, you know, the old fashioned in police investigation net that happens in any case. So I mentioned that the police first first tracked down two leads. Uh, that, I have to admit, was a strategic detail that I added because I want to remind the listeners that even without these types of um, you know, big data-driven police investigations, lots of innocent people wind up getting in the, um, you know, it, within the pool of suspicion. Um, and, and actually, the police, in order to rule out those two people, the police probably had to do things that were more invasive probably more anxiety inducing than they did with the 19 de-identified, you know, phone, phone numbers um, that were pulled up with this style of investigation. So I, I think you're asking the exactly the right question, which is what's the burden on the innocent, not just in terms of, you know, time and expense, but even the psychological burden. Um, but I'd, I'd argue we, we have to pick a fair baseline. We can't compare it to the perfect. No. And, and I, and, and I guess I would, I would even compare it to like DUI checkpoints, which to me are, are far more invasive because they're stopping everybody without a specific suspicion that this car has an impaired driver. It's, you know, that's really straining everybody through the same net in the hopes that we get lucky and, and get one person who's impaired. Um, yes, and right. How do you feel about just generally the idea that our cell phones or our smartphones in particular, they're tracking us everywhere we go. Do you think that's understood by most people or do they not care? So oh, I got, I've got, you know, the world at my fingertips. That's all I care about. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I, I do think um, that people tend to be, you know, bimodal, bimodal on this question that um, some people care deeply, some people probably don't know, <laughs> and then some people know and don't really care that much because their first priority is kind of a low friction lifestyle. Um, and so, uh, you know, in my own personal life, I actually tend to be one of those low friction people. But the reason I think is that I, whatever solution is going to come has to be through law or you know through public policy that makes sure that everyone's protected to a sufficient degree we can't expect everyone to kind of watch out for their own interests and turn off um and turn off tracking and 
you know, um, th- this is a collective problem, not an individual problem. I, you know, I don't want to sound too paranoid here, but there, there are times where I think if I want to speak privately with a friend or with one of my kids or something, I leave my cell phone somewhere else because I just have come to the understanding that no matter what, it's listening. And and I'm not necessarily meaning the NSA is hanging on every word, but uh, it's it's odd how many times I say something, you know, a trampoline and suddenly, boom, I'm seeing trampoline pads pop up in ads, you know, in, in places I never would have expected. It has to be listening for this to be happening. So, you know, it's funny. I've ha- myself have had some odd experiences like that. But I was just reading yesterday this study uh, by people, very, you know, skeptical people who were trying to find evidence that Amazon's Alexa is listening when it's not, when you're not interacting intentionally with it. And they, they did this really cool study looking at how, what types of ads are targeted based on what was said. When, and they didn't find evidence that it, <laughs> they, you know, at least their methodology didn't find evidence that it's listening when it's not supposed to. So who knows, though? You know, I, I think uh, I, I understand the concern. So um, we're down to about one minute here, but um, geofence warrants, this this is the phrase that describes what the what the police do here. Um, do you yeah. see this being addressed in any other court cases? Is, is this likely to come before the Supreme Court at any time? I think it's pretty likely. And the reason I think so is that, you know, this district court said that you cannot do what the police did here without a, without probable cause and a warrant. Uh, other courts have sort of silently a- a- allowed the process to to go forward without probable cause, um, and so I think we're going to see a, at some point a split a- across the courts, and so the Supreme Court will have to decide. I appreciate you being out in front and keeping us informed on this issue. Again, we're talking with Professor Jane Bambauer. She is a professor of law at University of Arizona and a Young Voices contributor. Where can people find you on social media? At Jane Yakowitz on Twitter. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. This is our final segment today, and we are happy to welcome back to the show Benjamin Benjamin Ayanian. Ben, good to have you back. Tell everybody just a little bit about yourself for those who are meeting you for the first time. Well, thanks for having me back, Brian. It's always good to be here. Um, I'm a college student right now, getting ready to graduate, actually, in less than a week or a little over a week, actually, right now. Um, so that's really exciting. I'm studying philosophy, business law, and political science, and I've been writing on on um, political issues now for about a year. I joined Young Voices about six months ago, and it's been great. Well, first of all, congratulations. I'm, I'm sure you. when that grind, that final grind is done, it's going to feel so good. And I'm happy to see that you have written about um, Elon Musk giving free speech some needed life support. And I guess people would have to be living in a cave with their fingers in their ears and their eyes shut not to know about the controversy swirling around uh, Musk's purchase of of Twitter. I'd like to get your take on um, is this a good thing? Is it uh, is it a neutral thing? You know, some people are saying it's the end of the world because free speech, apparently too much free speech is a terrible thing. Where do you come down on this issue? Well, I think that the idea that this is the end of the world is incredibly extreme. And I wrote about this issue, as you said, and I come down on the idea that I think this is going to be positive. Obviously, we have to wait and see what exactly comes out of this process. But as of now, I'm very optimistic about what this could mean for free speech. I've looked at some of the reforms that for Twitter or what he wants to do with Twitter. And I think that they're very rational. Um, he wants to soften content moderation. You know, we've seen a lot of viewpoint discrimination over the years. We've seen, you know, New York Post Hunter Biden laptop story kicked off of Twitter. Um, we saw discussions of the origins of the COVID-19 virus not allowed on social media. So we've, we've seen a lot of interesting debates not allowed to be had on these platforms. And to see Elon Musk come out and say, I believe in free speech. I think it's important for democracy. I want to soften content moderation, I think is a great thing. Um, he also really wants to crack down on bots on Twitter, which, you know, bots can be used to spread misinformation more quickly, to 
um, lure people into financial scams to try and drive traffic to products um, unnecessarily. And so I think that wanting to make users of Twitter, you know, prove that they are human, I think could be a great thing um, for political stability so that, you know, certain governments over the world can't use bots to spread false information quicker. He wants to encrypt direct messages so that no one can spy on your DMs or hack them. I think that that is a great thing. Um, He also wants to make the Twitter algorithms public so that anyone can review them and suggest edits. Um, there are some people that thinks that think that could have potential downsides. There was a review and uh, or an article in MIT Technology Review actually said they think that the harms could outweigh the benefits. They think there could be security concerns. Um, they think that open sourcing it could you know lead to people just copying it and changing it or figuring out how to game the system. So there's potential downsides there, but at the same time open sourcing the algorithm, which is a huge topic of debate among politicians, among citizens, I think would do a lot for transparency. And I think it shows a lot of humility that, you know, maybe our algorithms aren't perfect and we don't know how to fix them. Let's see what other people can come up with. You know, like I said, as that could have potential downsides, I also think that there are possibly great upsides to that. And so I think Elon Musk is approaching this the right way. I don't think there's any reason to think that the sky is going to fall. Um, I think that overall, this is a positive thing, and I'm very optimistic about what it could mean for public discourse. You know, I think one of the most telling exchanges I saw was I think it was a pan- group of panelists on CNN who were, were talking about how, well, the danger here is that someone could now that now that uh, Musk is taking over, he could use these algorithms to suppress points of view that he didn't like. He could use it to manipulate public opinion Why he could even use it perhaps to interfere with elections. And I went. Are they not describing everything that, you know, free speech advocates were complaining about Twitter doing already or in other words, what the left has been trying to do through various, you know, big tech platforms? It sounded like they may have been projecting their their own uh, misdeeds onto what what Musk might do if he got control. Yeah, I remember seeing that video on Twitter for the first time, and I actually thought it was a meme or a parody. I had to look and make sure this wasn't like a Babylon B video, because it it, it really is everything that we've been concerned about for the last few years that we feel has been happening. You know, a lot of, you know, they talked about dials being turned to turn up some information or turn up some voices and dials being turned to turn down others. And that's exactly what social media platforms do right now. Like I said, there was a huge um, story about Hunter Biden's laptop and his email specifically um, with his business about his business dealings overseas and how that involved Joe Biden. And that entire story, when the New York Post um, released it, was stopped from circulation on Twitter immediately. And so I think we should be concerned about things like that happening, no matter who it damages. And I think that to to believe that Elon Musk is going to introduce, you know, um, content restriction in a way that's politically harmful, I think I think it's tone deaf in a lot of ways to suggest that because we've been seeing it nonstop. I mean, there are a lot of people who think and and I think rightfully so that, you know, Russia used bots to try and spread some misinformation in 2016. You know, foreign governments, it's a way for them to influence our elections. And so I think regardless of whatever side of the aisle you land on, I think that to believe that we have not been seeing all of these issues that panelists on CNN and MSNBC are claiming are going to arise all of a sudden, I think you'd really have to cover your eyes and your ears for the last four eight, you know, maybe eight years, maybe even the last decade to truly believe that now is the time to panic and not that, oh, my gosh, we've seen all these issues over the last few elections. Maybe someone more open to free speech and wanting to make, you know, the way Twitter works more transparent. Um, I think you'd be crazy not think that that's that's a great thing. I noticed you pointed out in your article, and I think rightly so, it's not just the left that likes to, you know, push down on speech that it doesn't like the right can do this as well. Um, You know, you you give the example of uh, Governor DeSantis in in Florida, you know, putting the hammer down on on Disney because of of things that they are saying and and advocating that he doesn't like. Is free speech ever going to be something that we can all agree on or is it always going to be kind of a, a point of friction? 
I'm really not sure what the future holds for our discussions and debates surrounding free speech. I hope that it can become an issue that everyone can rally behind. After all, it is the first it's protected under the First Amendment in the United States Constitution. It should be the first thing we can all agree upon. If we want to have a debate about political issues, I should be able to raise my hand and say, OK, but can we all agree free speech is a good thing? Great. Let's move on to the next issue. But instead, there's there's a lot of interestingly nuance in this debate apparently there's a lot of different views that people hold on what is permissible speech and what is not but at the end of the day our constitution codifies that you can say almost anything you want if it's a political opinion if it's an opinion you can say whatever you want even if you are lying or if you're if you're wrong mm -hmm. you can say it either way now there are, it can be discussions that should be had about you know on on social media platforms should you be allowed to lie if you know you are lying the problem with that debate is that how are you supposed to know if someone is tweeting out misinformation just which is just false information right. or disinformation where they're trying to deceive people i think that it, it's too hard to distinguish the two I just wonder, you know, when Musk isn't talking about some kind of an anarchist free for all, you know, it's welcome to Thunderdome, you know, as far as free speech. He's just suggesting loosening the controls that have been used to tamp down certain viewpoints that uh, may or may not have been in, uh, you know, in harmony with our user agreement or whatever the case may be. But the reaction from those who, who don't want to see those controls loosened, I think has been way out of proportion to the actual threat posed. Now, that's just my opinion. I'd love to get your take on it. No, I agree with you fully on that point. I think that people are overreacting. Like I said, a lot of people believe the sky is falling. We're seeing media pundits talk about how we're going to have interference in our elections all of a sudden, like we haven't been seeing Impossible. that. Impossible. I know. It's, it's crazy these days. And so I, I, I do think that the, the horror that people, some people are feeling over this decision either is a product of them watching too much cable news, maybe, or they're not really reading about what Elon Musk has said or what he s says he plans to do. Ben, we've got about 30 seconds here. Give me your best take on why we have to become our own fact checkers. I think we have to become our own fact checkers because we can't trust other people to do it for us because they're not going to be better at it than we are. As long as we can all read the same sentences and, and at least comprehend what is being portrayed, we might come to different conclusions, um, but we'll at least be able to understand what we're looking at. It's up to us to read PDFs of legislation, of court rulings. It's up to us to fact check what people are saying, to try and read both sides. We can't just give that power to other people and expect them to do it better for us. Beautifully said. We are talking with Benjamin Ayanian. He is a Young Voices contributor. Ben, where can people find you on social media? The best place to follow me is um, Twitter, at Benjamin Ayanian. And um, that, yep, that's where I tweet all my writings and, and my opinions. So check it out.